The delineation of comic book history into specific ages is intrinsically tied to the superhero genre. This mainly occurs because that genre is directly associated with comic books. After all, it was the creation of superheroes that made a new medium unique and distinct from its newspaper origins. Of course, superheroes haven't always been the dominant genre, but they have been a steady presence since the very beginning of the medium. So it's no surprise that notable events in superhero history are what begins certain comic book ages. These are somewhat arbitrary points, but there is a reasoning behind them. There are other influential events that directly or indirectly affected the evolution of comic books from a primarily juvenile medium to its current state as a respectable method of artistic expression. Instead of focusing on one genre and its impact, this will contain many of the notable or significant developments of the medium. Some argue the modern age should be broken down into a few separate parts, such as the Dark Age, or the Copper Age, or the Plastic Age, or the Postmodern Age. There is no shortage of opinion or debate on this matter, but there is no consensus. Like the Bronze Age, the Modern Age has a beginning point that's debatable, but it's generally centered around one event, Crisis on Infinite Earths. Crisis erased 50 years of DC continuity, simplified the DC universe, and it led to a reboot of nearly all the company's titles. It was such a pivotal event, DC has attempted to recapture that lightning multiple times since. Most notably in 2005 with Infinite Crisis, and then Final Crisis in 2008, and Flashpoint in 2011, followed by New 52 in the same year, and then Rebirth in 2016 none of which were as influential or successful as the event that inspired them. Regardless, the defining feature of the beginning of the modern age may be one word, deconstruction, specifically the deconstruction of superheroes, although the strict definition of that word might not apply. What is generally meant is that superheroes got serious, or to use a term frequently used, things got grim and gritty. The serious trend was kicked off by the publication of both The Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen by DC, although Marvel also published Squadron Supreme, a 12-issue series that dealt with superheroes taking control and attempting to create a utopia. Thematically, they are all somewhat similar, but Squadron Supreme takes a classic approach to the concept of the superhero, with ideals that are, to a degree, basic and understandable. In Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, characterizations and motivations are rather murky, Put another way, Dark Knight and Watchmen are more mature, layered, and openly question the role of a superhero. The influence of Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns on the superhero genre is undeniable, and these works gave the medium itself a level of prestige. They weren't the only serious works being produced during this time, but they were the two pieces with the highest profile by a major publisher. In a general sense, when the dominant genre of the medium, superheroes, began to be taken seriously, the medium itself began to be taken seriously by the general public. Another defining feature of the modern age is the event comic. Event comics are usually centered around a short miniseries published as oversized issues. The premise of that miniseries is then expanded upon in regular, ongoing series. More often than not, these tie-ins were not essential whatsoever. For the most part, tie-ins merely filled in minor plot beats from the event storyline. However, these insignificant bits did have the effect of temporarily raising a title's sales, so these tie-ins became more and more common over time. Unlike modern times, the event comics of the late 80s and early 90s were usually published in the summer. This was to capitalize on the fact that their main audience was out of school and needed entertainment during the vacation season. Again, more often than not, these were blockbuster stories that usually had no impact on the ongoing titles once the story concluded. Certainly, there were exceptions, but the effect was usually limited to a few titles, not an entire product line. Events would go extinct when the comic book market crashed circa 1995, and then be revived in the early 2000s. However, these events had evolved. An event now included all titles from a publisher, were usually published over a lengthy amount of time, and they began at any point during a calendar year. Additionally, the effects of the event would be an ongoing feature of the publisher's fictional universe, or multiverse, whatever the case may be. Perhaps the most well-known aspect of the modern age is the sudden increase in popularity for comics and its acceptance as a valid form of artistic expression and as a form of entertainment, not just for children, but for adults too. Due to a variety of factors, comic books attained a high profile during the late 80s and early 90s. 
The grim and gritty trend, along with the proliferation of other, more literate material, began to dispel the notion that the art form was strictly juvenile entertainment. The general public embraced comic books once again, and sales skyrocketed, as did the cost of back issues. All of this snowballed into the perception that comic books, all comic books, were a healthy, worthwhile investment. This turned out to be untrue, specifically for current titles. Many, many people soon discovered that investing in hot new titles was a disappointing venture. As a result, sales began to drop, and then they dropped even further. Smaller publishers closed their doors, and many comic book stores went out of business. The latter half of the 90s was a new period of uncertainty for the industry. The big two, Marvel and DC, did their best to remain solvent. DC managed to stabilize. Marvel, which had become a publicly traded company in 1991, declared bankruptcy and spent the better part of a decade getting stable once again. Just before this dark period, seven creators joined together to form their own publishing company, Image Comics. Its success and influence practically defines the early 90s. Image was primarily dedicated to the seven founders and their work. However, other well-known artists were invited into the fold once the company was established. Despite displaying unity in the press, disagreements between the founders quickly emerged. One founder, Rob Liefeld, was removed in 1996, and another founder, Jim Lee, sold his studio to DC in 1999. The loss of two founders and the terrible state of the industry forced the publisher to diversify. This led to a variety of unknown or unproven talent being published at Image. Quite possibly, allowing outsiders to use Image as a publishing platform may have saved the company from dissolving entirely. Currently, Image Comics is the premier publisher for established and new talent to create and own their material. Self-contained universes became a popular publishing tactic during the modern age. Perhaps the most notable was CrossGen, which launched with a series of titles in 1998 that were seemingly unrelated, but all took place within a shared universe. However, there were many more examples. In fact, the early aforementioned Image Comics were a loose, poorly defined shared universe. Valiant Comics, an imprint established by Jim Shooter after he was fired from Marvel, launched a series of titles mainly based on older gold key properties. Ironically, Shooter was fired by his investors and he went on to create Defiant Comics. This was another shared universe approach, but it failed almost as soon as it launched. Malibu Comics, who made a considerable amount of money being Image Comics' first publisher, launched their own universe in 1993, the Ultraverse. The publisher would be subsequently bought out by Marvel in 1994. Dark Horse also attempted their own shared universe in 1994 with Comics' Greatest World. These were some reasonably successful titles, but it slowly faded out of existence within a few years. For the record, CrossGen went bankrupt in 2004, and all its properties were purchased by Disney. Disney then purchased Marvel in 2009. So like Malibu, all CrossGen titles are owned by Marvel. In recent years, the Valiant universe has re-emerged and continues to present day. Both Marvel and DC would experiment with imprints that were more adult and creator-friendly. Epic Comics allowed creators to retain their rights, but functionally became extinct by 1990. This was possibly due to the fact that the publishing lineup never established an identity, nor did it have a massive hit. Some titles, such as Dreadstar, did well, but sales were nothing compared to Marvel's mainstream lineup. In 1993, DC established Vertigo Comics, an imprint that initially published the offbeat titles DC had offered. Vertigo had the benefit of beginning with well-known, highly regarded series, such as Sandman, Swamp Thing, Hellblazer, Doom Patrol, and Animal Man all of which had a distinct superhero flavor. Over time, the lineup would expand and the superhero element diminished in favor of the supernatural. Vertigo developed a creator-friendly environment that allowed for more adult content. Like all publishing ventures in the 90s, its sales were not great, but it maintained a level of prestige and became a reasonably good place for new talent to explore new concepts. Unfortunately, by the mid-2000s, Image Comics had taken Vertigo's place in the comic book market in 2020, Vertigo was officially shuttered and replaced with DC Black Label, an imprint that explores darker superhero-based stories. During the early 90s, newsstand distribution was phased out. Direct market distribution became the only manner of distribution for all comic book companies. 
This factor, along with the acceptance that comics were a diverse field, offering a variety of content for both young people and adults, led to the Comics Code finally ending. The censorship board was closed, and publishers instituted their own internal rating system. Despite being effectively useless since the early 90s, the Comics Code wasn't shut down completely until 2011. Ironically, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, a nonprofit organization that was founded to defend comic books deemed as obscene, purchased the intellectual property rights to the Comics Code. In other words, the infamous seal of approval is now owned by an organization that defended work the Comics Code would have never approved. Hello again, I hope you're all doing well. As mentioned in the prior video, I decided to split this age into two parts. It's just that long. I mean, a lot happened in 35 years. Anyway, this might be a good time to briefly address a few comments the prior videos have received. Just to paraphrase, some have wondered why I didn't mention certain bits of comic book history, or didn't go into more detail here and there. Well, the answer to all these questions is, this was never intended to be a definitive history of comics. There are many points of discussion that do deserve a closer look, such as the history of Dell, or Fawcett, or the Canadian comics of the 40s, for example. This video series, in my opinion, is much like a Rosetta Stone. It's like an outline for this channel, so to speak. Past videos, such as the copyright battle between DC and Fawcett, the seduction of the innocent, the history of Charlton, the underground comics, and the speculator era, to name but a few, are examples of taking a closer look at specific points outlined in this series, and future videos will expand on those finer points. Put another way, Know Your Comic History is the skeleton, and everything else, almost all the other videos on this channel, fleshes out the details. Got it? Excellent. Now, all of these fine people you see on the screen right now directly support this channel, and you can too. There are links below to subscribe, become a member, or donate, or to like the video or leave a comment, all of which is greatly appreciated by this humble, highly overworked, uh, I, I don't know, creator, creative overlord. I've never known what label to throw on myself. Regardless, I'm working my hot patootie off to maintain that support and, quite honestly, get this channel to a point where I can proudly say, my full-time job? I make reasonably decent videos about comic books on YouTube. Alright, that's enough about me for now. Back to the grind. I will talk at you later.